we're going to have prayer and ask for God's uh, guidance and his blessing to be with us. So why don't we kneel as far as possible for prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, we recognize that you have been with us in a marked manner. We thank you for the mighty manifestation of your power that has been in our meetings, which has been through the message that you have brought to your people, the meet and do season, the message seasoned with the early and latter rain, in order to prepare a final generation to stand in this last crisis, which is going to usher in the second coming of Jesus Christ. We believe that we've been experiencing revival and reformation in our hearts and in our lives, and we know that it's just simply the beginning. With, with some and with others, it's just uh, simply maintaining what you have already been doing for them. And so now we just, again, ask and pray that you would baptize us anew with your spirit, that you would anoint our minds and our hearts as we have this last uh, message. May you bring everything back to our remembrance and may you bring these things to a conclusion and bring us to a decision where we can go all the way with thee and we can be found on the side of truth and righteousness in the glorious holy mountain. This is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Please take your Bibles and turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17. And it's always a wonderful opportunity when we get to study from Revelation because Jesus has pronounced a blessing to those that read, hear, and keep those things which are written therein for the time as at hand. And I don't know about you, but I'm in need of heaven's blessings. And so we should want and desire to hear more from Revelation. Amen. Well, sad to say, we, we really don't hear too much from the book of Revelation. Maybe when it's a seminar or maybe when it's a special occasion. Uh, but in these last days, I believe that the books of Daniel and Revelation uh, demand our attention and our, our study. And so in Revelation chapter 17... We're going to look at a verse here together. Now, Revelation 17, when most people approach this uh, chapter, will focus on the uh, mystery of uh, Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. We may focus on um, the seven heads, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come, and when the other one comes, he continues for a short space, and... Uh, when the eighth comes, he's going to rule, and uh, he's going to go down, he's going to go into perdition, and the seven kings, and so on and so forth, but, and all those are important, by the way, and we do study those things, and those subjects today are present truth, and it is important to understand them. However, I'd like to introduce a subject to you that most people when they study Revelation 17 they don't really focus on and or maybe perhaps they have not seen it but in verse 14 of Revelation 17 and this is what we want to study uh, for the next hour or so Revelation 17 verse 14 the Bible tells us here thee shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them for he is Lord of lords and King of kings and they that are with him are called and chosen and, and faithful. And in these meetings, we've been focusing not only on the prophetic word, but also the experience of righteousness by faith, because I believe that God's people will understand both the prophetic message correctly, as well as having the experience of Christ our righteousness, because those that give the final loud cry warning message, they have to lighten the earth with his glory. And you can't lighten the earth with Christ's glory unless that glory is in you and an I. And so in verse number 14, we want to study who are these that are called, chosen, and faithful. 
And the Bible tells us that even though they're going to be warred against by the dragon, beast, and false prophet, it says that the Lamb is going to overcome. And so that is assurance, and that is um, comfort to you and I to be on the winning side of the great controversy. And so now, who are these that are with him, that are called, chosen, and faithful? I want you to notice in Revelation chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. Revelation 14 and verse number 1. They that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Revelation 14, 1 says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him, an hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Notice that on Mount Zion, there are a hundred and forty-four thousand with the lamb, having the father's name. Those that are with him on Mount Zion are the same ones that are with him in Revelation 17, called and chosen and faithful. So even though Revelation 17 talks about the woman that reigneth over the kings of the earth, and it talks about the uh, seven heads, and it talks about the mountains, and it talks about the beast of perdition, and the kings that commit fornication with her, in Revelation 17 we also see the 144,000. In Revelation chapter 17, a chapter in which most of it is all about what, what Satan is doing and the earthly powers that he's going to use in these last days. But here we also see God's people in Revelation chapter 17, just as we would see them in chapter 12 or in chapter 10 or in chapter 14 of the book of Revelation. So now I want you to notice with me now what it means for them to be with him, to be with the Lamb, to follow him whithersoever he Go with. Notice with me in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, because they're with the Lamb. And I just want to look at the Lamb just for a moment here. In Revelation 12, turn with me there, Revelation 12, verse number 11. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11. We have been told that we all need to strive to be among the 140 and 4,000. And there can be no striving to be amongst that number unless we study about them. Now, I want you to notice in Revelation 12, beginning in verse number 11, the Bible says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto the death. So the fact that they are following the Lamb, you know that they are overcomers by his precious blood, and therefore they're able to overcome the dragon and the beast and the false prophet because they're with the Lamb. Now, what is it that the Lamb's blood enables you and I to overcome in our lives? Notice Revelation chapter 1 with me. Turn to Revelation 1, the book of Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. And I'd like to read the greeting of John, the Revelator, to you and I this afternoon. Verse number 4 of Revelation 1 says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be with you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So the fact that this, it says that they overcame by the blood of the Lamb, you know that they overcame sin, all right? So the Bible tells us that the 144,000 will be overcomers of all sin, both hereditary and cultivated, in word and thought and action. They're going to have victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil through the blood of the Lamb, the blood of the everlasting covenant, which was shed to make us perfect in every good work, like we talked about yesterday. Working in us that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. But now, in verse 5 it says that, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So before Jesus even washed us from our sins in his own blood, before he even died for us and decided to remove sin from us, he first loved us. All right, he first loved us and he washed us in his blood from our sins. So love is what motivated him to come and to die for you and I. And it is also that same love that causes him to want to wash us from sin. But now go to Revelation 7 now. Turn to Revelation 7. 
Revelation 7, Revelation chapter 7, and let's look at verses 13 and 14. Revelation 7, verses 13 and 14. The Bible tells us, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now wait a minute, here's a question. In Revelation 1.5, we just read the text that says, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Jesus washed us from sin. But in Revelation chapter 7, who's doing the washing here? Let me, let me ask the question again. Who's doing the washing here in Revelation 7, verse 13 and 14? God's people. So, so wait a minute. Who is doing the washing I thought Jesus washes us. Does not Jesus wash us? Yes. But then these people are doing the washing here. So, wait a minute. Which is it? Does Jesus wash or do we wash? It's both. It's both. The washing that Christ does is the work of justification. For sins that are past. What is justification? That's a big fancy word today. You know, Paul was a theologian. He was very heavy. Justification just simply means to be declared righteous. Right doing. By his blood. Because we cannot make ourselves righteous. We can't make ourselves holy. We cannot remove one spot or stain or wrinkle or blemish from our characters. No matter how hard we try. But, in chapter 7, it says they're washing their robes. What do, what do robes represent? Garments or characters. So, what is this work of washing the robes representing here? You see, this is the work of sanctification. You see, this is the work of overcoming, even as he overcame. Now, notice, Jesus washes and we wash, but notice, what's the... What's the Ingredient, and I don't want to liken the blood of Christ to some laundry detergent, okay? But it's his blood that is washing. So Christ shed his blood to wash us and justify us. But in chapter 7, we're washing our garments and overcoming those defects in the character that swell our garments. But whose blood is it that we're washing our garments in? Still Jesus' blood. So... Justification, sanctification, it's still his blood. We're justified by his blood. We're sanctified by his blood. Justification and sanctification, there's a cooperation that's going on here. God does his part for us, a part that we cannot do for ourselves. But yet there's a part that we have to do that God is not going to do for us. You know why? Because he's already given us the power to do it. God is working in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So you're simply working out what grace is working inside. And so this is the experience of the 144,000 as they're following the lamb, whithersoever he goes, and they make their garments white in the blood of the lamb. Now, once they've made their garments white in the blood of the lamb, what takes place now? What can happen now? Glorification, yes. Go with me to Revelation 19. Revelation 19. And let's look at verse 6. What happens now that this work of overcoming, this work of sanctification, which is nothing more than just maintaining the justified walk, the justified experience, remaining righteous, Walking even as he walked. As you receive Christ Jesus, so walk ye in him. In the book of Revelation 19, verse 6, it says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. 
Heaven is all excited. Why? Because the wife has made herself ready. Now, I haven't been to too many weddings. I'm sure that some of you in here maybe have been to a whole lot of weddings. Some women in here have been married before. And from my understanding, and you could tell me if I'm wrong or not, but oftentimes when it comes to weddings, and this doesn't go for all women that have been married, but sometimes in the wedding, who is everybody waiting for? The bride to come in. The, the bridegroom will be there. The minister will be there. The, the guests will be there. The flowers are there. Everything's said, looking all nice and beautiful and glorious that special day. And yet, who is everybody waiting on? Who is everybody's attention on? The bride. Can there be a wedding without the bride? No. And everybody doesn't talk about how good the, the groom looks. Oh, yeah, he looks handsome. Oh, yeah, he looks good. But everybody's always talking about how that bride looked. Oh, wasn't she just a, a, a gem? She was just a diamond. She was just this. She was just that. Oh, I, I didn't know she could on and on and on. Heaven is saying, listen, we can rejoice. We're happy. We're excited. Why? Because the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. So heaven is excited and they're looking forward to you and I getting ready more than you want to get ready let me let me repeat that again heaven is more excited and more interested and just can't wait for us to get ready and have greater anticipation of it and greater expectations than you yourself have of getting ready wanting to be there for in verse 8 it says how do we know she made herself ready? Verse 8, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the what? Righteousness of saints. How did she make herself ready? The washing, the work of overcoming, making the garments white in the blood of the Lamb has taken place. She has received that white raiment that Christ wanted to give in to the Laodicean church. What makes the garments white? It's his blood that was shed that makes those garments white. So once his people are faithful in the work of overcoming and they receive the straight testimony, they buy the gold and the white raiment in the eye salve. Now the wedding can take place. Do you expect to get married to the bridegroom, to Christ, and you don't have the proper clothing on? Let me ask those, maybe in this room, some have been bridesmaids before, or you've been uh, those that are with the grooms before. Now, what if you said, okay, listen, I know I've been invited to this wedding of my friends, and I know that the colors are going to be uh, blue and white. Okay, but you know what, I'm deciding that I'm going to come to the wedding, but instead of wearing blue and white, I've decided I'm going to wear purple and orange. Yeah, because I, I just want to wear purple and orange, and I'm going to still be in the wedding. So as I come with my purple and orange, it doesn't matter that everybody else is wearing white and blue. I'm going to wear purple and orange, and, and by the way, the, the bride, she's my best friend. I mean, she's like my sister. We've grown up, so, you know, she's going to accept me, and everybody's going to allow me to come in anyway. Nobody agrees with me? No? Why not? Because if you don't wear the garments, you're not going to get in the wedding. I don't care who you are. Matthew 22 taught us that. Remember that man that came in to the wedding feast? What did he say? He came in and they said, friend, what, what are you doing here? How, how did you get in here? You don't, where's the wedding garment? It was provided for you. It was given to you. Why didn't you wear it? What did he say? He started giving all these reasons why he didn't want to wear it, right? He, he started providing all these excuses why he, he, he just couldn't find time to put it on, right? Maybe it didn't fit him right. Maybe it was, it, 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 it was the wrong color or something like that. No, what did he say? Why didn't he have anything to say? Because there was no excuse. No excuse. You see, when heaven puts this much time and this, this much effort in getting us ready. And all of heaven is interested in your salvation. At the end of the day, what are you going to be able to say? Not going to be able to say anything. And so those that are with him are those that are prepared for this marriage. They've gone through the work of 
overcoming. They've ironed out all the defects, all the wrinkles, all the spots, and all the blemishes. They've made themselves ready by having those garments in his blood, and now they're made white, and now they're ready. Heaven is rejoicing. The marriage of the Lamb can take place. And these that are involved, the Bible says they're called, chosen, and faithful. How were they called? How were they chosen? How were they faithful? In order for us to understand that, we need to know what has God called us to do in these last days? Because everybody would agree that the 144,000 are called. They're chosen and faithful. Have you been called? Have I been called? What has God called us to do? I want you to turn to the book of Isaiah 43. Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43, you know, if we could just understand and answer this question, much, much of the, the problems and the trials and the difficulties we have in our life would be removed. Did you know that? We'd have happier lives. We'd be more content. We'd be at peace. We would actually enjoy living the Christian life if we could understand what God has called us to do. Notice what the Bible says in Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43, beginning in verse 7, the Bible says, Even every man that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory, I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Look at verse 21. Verse 21 says, This people have I formed for myself, they shall show forth my praise. What have we been called to do? The Bible says, even everyone that's called by my name, for the Bible says in verse 7, that I have created him for my glory. What has God called us to do in this world? To reflect the glory of God in our lives. What's the purpose of our creation? His glory. Our purpose in this world is not to be movie stars. Not to be sports stars, not to be beautiful models and actresses and to, to be famous in the world. You see, because all those people that do those things, they don't bring glory to God, do they? No, they bring glory to self. They were created for His glory. They were called by His name. They were to show forth His praise. So those of us that live to the glory of self instead of the glory of God... We are not answering the purpose of our creation. And if we don't answer the purpose of our creation, then it would have been better that we would not have been brought into this world. And that's the reason why people are not happy. That's the reason why people don't have joy. They don't have peace because there's a void, there's a longing in their heart that the world cannot satisfy. We were made to glorify Him. That should be our whole object in everything that I do, in my worship, in my marriage, in my, my job, in my education, my music, my diet, everything, my thoughts and feelings, everything foremost should be the glory of God. Whatsoever therefore I eat or whatsoever therefore I drink or whatever I do, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, do it to whose glory? God's glory. Now notice what the Bible says. In the book of 1 Corinthians 11, let me ask you a question. Was man made in the image of God? When man was made in the image of God, was he made in the glory of God? Notice what it says in 1 Corinthians 11. Was man made in the image of God? Yes. When he was made in the image of God, did he come out bearing forth God's glory? Notice what it says in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The Bible says, beginning with verse number 7, it says here, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. Notice, the Bible says that man and women too, his creation, Adam and Eve were both made in his image, it says he is the image and glory of God. So what is that telling us? When man was made, he was made in God's image, physically, mentally, and spiritually, and he was to show forth that glory. 
All right, that was his purpose. That was his calling in life. But what happened? Did man continue to reflect that glory? No, he didn't. What happened to man? He sinned. What happens when we sin? Romans chapter 3, yes. Romans chapter 3. What happens when we sin? Notice in Romans 3, you see, when Adam was made, he was made in the glory and image of God. Now, when Adam had Seth, and Seth was to compensate or to substitute for the loss of Abel, the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 5 that Adam brought forth a son made in his own likeness and his own image. What's wrong with that picture? Seth should have been in the image of God, just like his father Adam was in the image of God. But see, when the glory of God was lost through sin, man could only now reproduce his own image and not God's image. For in Romans 3.23 it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Therefore, when Jesus came on the earth in Luke 19, verse 10, Jesus says, For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. It didn't say he was coming to save them that were lost. It says in Luke 19, 10, 19, 9, 19, 10, that he was coming to save that which was lost. Question, what was lost? The glory of God. The glory of God was lost in man. That's what he came back to restore in man. Now, how does this happen? How do we get the glory of God back? We lost it through sin. We had it at first. We've been called to glorify him and to be in his image. This is the purpose for education, to restore the moral image of God back in man. But how do we get it back? Second Thessalonians. Turn with me there. Second Thessalonians, the second chapter. Second Thessalonians. How do we get the glory of God back? Second Thessalonians, chapter 2, and verse 14. Second Thessalonians, chapter 2, and verse 14. The Bible says, as a matter of fact, let's begin, let, yes, verse 14 says, Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wait a minute. The Bible says he's called us. Called us to what? What does the Bible say? What did he call us to? Obtain. Now, wait, what does it mean to obtain something? Do, do, you, do you obtain something that you already have or obtain something you don't have? You obtain something that you don't have. And what is it that we don't have, that we once had or once they had before sin? Wherefore the Lord, the Bible says, has called you by our gospel to the obtaining of what? How are we going to get this glory back? How are we going to get this character back? Yes, that's a good answer. That's a good answer. That's all true. Very good. Even, 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 even better, even, even better, yes. Very true. What does the Bible text say? What does the Bible tell let, let, Let's look at that again. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. How are we going to get it back? The gospel. The everlasting gospel. Notice in Revelation 14. I knew we'd get it after a while. All your answers are right. They're all beautiful. I have no problem with none of them. Revelation 14. Revelation chapter 14. You see, now you begin to understand what the purpose of the everlasting gospel is. What, is. what is the purpose of the three angels' messages? What does it do for you and I? In verse 6, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying, with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. 
for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and the earth and the sea and fountains of waters. How are we going to give God glory without receiving the gospel? Can you give God glory without receiving the everlasting gospel? The power of God unto salvation? For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written. Just shall live by faith. No, you can't. So, how has God called us in the last days? What has he called us to? To the obtaining of God's glory, that character. How are we going to do it? Through the gospel. What gospel message? The eternal gospel, the everlasting gospel, the first angel's message. So notice, the 144,000 are called by what? What are they called by? What are they called by? How, what is, God's called them to reflect his glory, to give him glory. So then how, what, so how have they been called then? Well, let me ask it this way. What message has called the 144,000 to reflect his or to obtain his glory? First angel's message. See, I knew it was me. Maybe I was just asking the question the wrong way. All right. So the 140,000 are called by the first angel's message. But they're not just called by the first angel. They've also been what? Chosen. How have they been chosen? How have they been chosen? What does it mean to be chosen? I want you to turn with me in your Bibles now to the book of John. Turn to John chapter 15. If God has called us, he's chosen us. And we need to make our calling and election sure. Why? Because many are what? Many are called, but few are chosen. What has God chosen us to do after he's called us by the first angel's message? What has he chosen us to do? John 15. The book of John 15. John 15, beginning in verse 18, says, If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Why does the world hate you? You're not of the world. Why are you not of the world? I can't, I, I, yes, I can't be in the world because I've been chosen. Chosen where? Out of the world. I've been chosen out of this world. Therefore, the world hates me. Now, what's in the world? It says he's chosen you. He's chosen you to come out of the world. Not that you can't depart and exit this world unless he takes you, but... You're of the world, you're, you're in the world, living on this earth, but you're not of the world. Seems like somebody's trying to reach me. They don't know what I'm doing right now. Um, notice, he's chosen us out of the world. Well, what's in the world? The pleasures of this world. What are those pleasures? Turn over to 1 John chapter 2 with me. Book of 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 15. He's called us by the first angel's message. When you respond to the first angel's message, he has chosen you out of the world. When you think about it, how many people in the world understand the Bible the way you have the privilege to understand it? Think about that for a moment. How many Christians out there? How many churches out there? And yet how many people understand the mysteries of Daniel Revelation, the mysteries of the uh, parables of the kingdom that Christ taught. How many understand those things rightly? It's not many people. What does that let you know? You've been chosen. Does that mean that you're better than everybody? No. It just means that you have responded to the call. You've responded to the message. And therefore, he's chosen you. But now, go to 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. It says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away in the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So what, what is in the world? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the what? Pride of life. He has, so he's chosen us out of the world. 
chosen us to be separate from the what? Lust of the flesh, lusts of the eyes, and the pride of life. Why? Because in James chapter 4, what happens if we profess to be Christ and that we belong to him and that we're not of this world, but yet we are partaking of the things of this world? What do you think that would make us? Adulterers. Is that so? Go to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. Let's notice what the scripture says. James 4.4. 4. James 4.4 4 says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. You try to be a friend of the world and a friend of God? Can you do it? No. No. You can't. The Bible says you are an adulterer or an adulteress. What is an adulterer? What is an adulterer? Adulterer is somebody that is supposed to be married to one, but they are cheating or they're unfaithful to the vow. Close along with adultery is also fornication. So the Bible says when we mix with this world and when we partake of the things of this world and we give ourselves into worldly demands and worldly customs even though we know better, that's spiritual adultery. That's spiritual fornication. God wants to call us out from spiritual adultery and spiritual fornication. Now where is the center? Where is the, the, the foundation of all spiritual adultery and spiritual fornication? Heard a couple of answers. <laughs> so the mother church, okay. <laughs> Where's the foundation, the, the center of all spiritual adultery and spiritual fornication? Yes, is self, I agree with that. Satan? Mm hmm. What? Babylon. Babylon. How has Babylon made the whole world fall? Why or what? So the whole world ha has fallen and has become corrupted because of her wine of the wrath of her fornication. What has God chosen us? When God says, I've chosen you out of the world, what is he choosing us out of? Babylon. Babylon. Go with me in your Bibles to the book of Haggai. Haggai, chapter 2. Haggai chapter 2. Listen to what it says here. In verse 23. Has God truly chosen us out of Babylon? Chosen us out of the world? Yes, if you responded to the first angel he has. If you've responded to the everlasting gospel, it demands a separation from the world. We can no longer serve two masters. We can't serve Baal and God. We can't be hot or lukewarm. No, God has chosen us out of the world. The mighty cleaver of truth has cut us out of the world and from the churches that reject the gospel of Revelation 14. Haggai 2.23 says this, In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, will I take thee, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shelethiel, saith the Lord, and will make thee as a signet, for I have chosen thee, saith the Lord of hosts. Now notice, God has called, has called a man, and he's chosen a man by the name of Zerubbabel. Now let me ask a question. How many here would name their son Zerubbabel? Say no thank you. Why not? Because we say... It's too long, or it's too hard to pronounce, or just doesn't sound right. It doesn't sound cute enough, right? So I'm not going to name my kids Zerubbabel and put them in school and, or put them around kids and have them be teased, right? But why did Hebrew mothers and fathers in biblical times name their children? Was it because it sounded cute or sounded nice and we just like the sound of it. Why, why, where, what did the names represent back then? 
character and messages. Characters and messages. Why? So that every time that child's name was called, they could be reminded of their, the character that God wanted to see develop in them, but also that they had a distinct message and mission in the world. And it was to remind them of their calling and that they had been chosen. So let's take the name Zerubbabel for a minute. Zerubbabel or Zerubbabel. I don't know, I might be pronouncing it wrong and I don't want to mess it up for anyone. Zerub means one that is sown in or born in, brought up in or raised in. What about Babel? That should be a little easier. Babel. Confusion. Babylon, which is confusion. Babylon. Zerubbabel or Zerubbabel, one that was born in Babylon, brought up in Babylon, and especially during the 70 year captivity of, of, of uh, ancient Israel and ancient Babylon, but he eventually is chosen out of Babylon. Amen. Is there a message concerning come out of Babylon? What was he chosen to do? What was Zerubbabel or Zerubbabel chosen to do? Look at Zechariah chapter 4 with me. Zechariah chapter 4. Listen. Zechariah chapter 4. Notice what it says. Zechariah chapter 4. Zechariah chapter 4. The Bible says, verse 5, then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Z Z Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? Uh, thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Moreover, the Lord uh, uh, said unto me, or came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hand shall also finish it, thou shalt know, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet of the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. What was Zerubbabel called out of Babylon or chosen out of Babylon to do as his servant? First of all, the Bible says in verse 9 that his hands have laid the foundation. The foundation, that's the end of the work, right? Just trying to see if you're still with me. It's the beginning of the work, right? But then the Bible says that his hands shall also finish the work. And he'll bring the headstone or the capstone. When do you put the capstone on? At the end when you're finished. So Zerubbabel is symbolizing those that come out of Babylon for the purpose of building the foundation of the temple and then also finishing the work. Zerubbabel is symbolizing the beginning of Adventism and the ending of Adventism. He's, re he's representing God's people at the end of the world. And what were they to do when they came out of Babylon and they built the, rebuilt the temple? Go to Isaiah 58 with me. Isaiah 58. You see, when God chooses us out of Babylon, he gives us a work to do. You respond to the first angel's message, you become God's workman. God now fills you with the gifts and fruits of the Spirit. And he gives you your ministry. Because God's not going to uh, choose us without giving us a calling. That's why the, most, the very important thing, the most important thing that any young man can know or any woman can know is to know who they are in Christ, to know what their calling is. Before they discuss or desire to want to find a life partner, 
you better know what you're called to do and she better know what she's called to do and then see if together both of you can answer the call of God. Otherwise, if not. Amen. I don't even have to say it. Isaiah 58, you already know. Some things you don't need a preacher to tell you. Experience tells you. Isaiah 58. But the Bible says in verse 12, Isaiah 58, 12, And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. Restore the law of God. Could they repair the breach while they were still in Babylon? No, you got to come out of Babylon to build the old waste places, restore, uh, raise up the foundations of many generations, repair the breach that the man of sin, the Antichrist, has made in the law, and restore the paths, to dwell in the paths of righteousness and truth, the foundations of many generations. This is the work that God has chosen us to do, but we have to come out of the world. We have to come out of Babylon in order to accomplish it. Now, in the Bible, who's the first one, or who's the first man that we find coming out of Babylon? Abraham, or Abram, Abraham, same person. Abram, Abraham. What does the Bible say about him? Go to Nehemiah chapter 9. How did he come out of Ur of the Chaldees, Babylon? How do you call him? How do you call him? Abraham, Abraham, right? How do you call him? Second angel's message. Now, what would cause you to come to that conclusion, which is correct? Was it so? Did, did he respond to the, the gospel, perhaps? Hmm. Mighty quiet. Um, let's go to Galatians. Hold, hold your place in Nehemiah. We're, we're going to come back to Nehemiah, but I, I want to go to Galatians because, we, because this young man said that it was the second angel's message by which he was able to come out of the Chaldees. And I think that we all know that the Ur Chaldees is Babylon. Now, let's go to Galatians 3. Because the question was asked, did he have the gospel preached to him? Was it the gospel that called him out? Let's see, Galatians 3. Galatians chapter 3, beginning with verse 6. Galatians 3, 6 says, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham, and the scripture foreseeing. Well, what does it mean to foresee something? future, see beforehand, or prophesying. The scripture prophesying before that God would justify the heathen through the faith, or through faith, preach before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. How did Abraham come out of Ur of the Chaldees? Same way that we have to come out of spiritual Babylon, the gospel. What gospel? There's only one, the everlasting gospel. Why was it that three angels, three messengers, came to him in Genesis 18 and said that Sarah was going to have Isaac, and they also revealed the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah? which those same two angels, two of those angels, the, the one angel was Christ, the other two were with him. Those other two angels that were with Abraham were the ones that went and rescued Lot. Out of where? Sodom, which is a type of the fall of Babylon at the end of the world. Two angels' messages, two angels to get you out. And so we find that Abraham received the everlasting gospel. And Abraham is the father of many nations, is he not? He's the father of the Jews. He's the father of Islam. He's the father of Christianity. But he's also the father of the 144,000. 
Is that a strange concept or a strange idea? What did God say to Abraham? I want to go to Nehemiah, but let, let me go to Genesis now. I'm, I'm going to go to Nehemiah, but let's go to Genesis because we said that Abraham's the father of the 144,000. Is that, is that accurate? Is that so? I, let's, let's look at something here in Genesis 13. Because God says something very interesting. Now, Genesis chapter 13, we say, I, I believe... Not chapter 13. Let's go to chapter 15. That's about the dust. Let's see, Genesis 15. No, I'm going to have to come back. Go to Nehemiah chapter 9. I'm going to come back to Genesis later. Gen uh, Nehemiah the ninth chapter. Notice what it says in Nehemiah chapter 9 concerning Abraham. Then we're going to come back to Genesis. The Bible says in Nehemiah 9, and beginning with verse 5, it talks about all the priests, talks about all the Levites, blessing God, praising God, blessing His glorious name, exalting Him. In verse 6 it says, Thou, even Thou art Lord alone, Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, and the earth and all things that are therein, the seas and all that is therein, and thou preservest them all, and the whole host of heaven worshipeth thee. Does that sound familiar to us? What does that sound like to you? Sabbath, Revelation. 14, 16, the first angel's message, very good. Verse 7, thou art the Lord, the God who didst choose, who? Abram, and broughtest him forth out of Ur of the Chaldees, and gavest him the name of Abraham, and foundest his heart faithful before thee, and madest a covenant with him to give the Land. So we see here that God called him out of Ur the Chaldees. He called him out of Babylon. Notice in Acts 13. Turn with me there to Acts 13. Acts chapter 13. Acts 13. And we'll look at verse 17 together. The book of Acts. Mm -hmm. 13. Verse 17. Notice what it says here. The Bible says in Acts 13, 17, The God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt, and with an high arm brought he them out of it. God chose Abram out of Babylon, then he chose Israel out of Egypt to be his people. Now, back to what we were saying earlier about Abraham. He's the father of Islam, the father of the Jews, the father of Christianity, but also the father of the 144,000. How do we know? Go back to Genesis 15. Genesis 15. That was Acts 13, 17. Now we want to go to Genesis 15. Genesis 15. Notice what God says here. Genesis chapter 15 and verse 5 says, And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the what? Tell the stars. If thou be able to number them, and he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. So when he looked up at the stars, it was symbolic of how his what? His seed would be. Who are those stars? at the end of the world that would be of the seed of Abraham and would be a part of his descendants. Who? Okay, now, go to Daniel 12. Now, now, now. I think we're beginning to comprehend. When I said it earlier, I had a lot of um, strange and puzzled looks, but that's okay because it just shows that the wheels, the mind is turning. Look at Daniel 12. Look at Daniel 12. 
Who are those stars in the last days that will be of the seed of Abraham? Daniel 12, 3. Daniel 12, 3. The Bible says in Daniel 12, 3, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. There's the seed of Abraham. There's descendants. You and I, God's people. And by the way, when God told him that promise, that that's how his seed would be, as the stars are, the Bible says, And Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So what was God doing? He was telling a prophecy about God's people in the world, and he believed it, and then he was what? Righteous. So what makes us righteous? What, what else is a part of righteousness? Surely Christ's righteousness by faith in obeying Christ, but as he obeyed the prophecy, the Bible says he was righteous. Because in that prophecy was the gospel. Again, we can't separate the gospel from prophecy. We can't separate righteousness by faith from prophecy. So God has called us by the first angel's message. He's chosen us by the second angel's message to do a work in these last days. But now, it's not good enough just to be called. It's not good enough just to be chosen. We also have to be faithful. Faithful. Turn with me now in your Bibles to the book of Revelation 14. Now, if, if, if we're called by the first angel and we're chosen by the second angel, then how do you think we'll prove to be faithful? By the third angel's message. The Bible tells us in Revelation 14. Revelation 14, 9 through 11 gives you the warning against the beast, the mark of the beast, the image of the beast. Verse 12 says this, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commands of God and the what? Faith of Jesus. Faith of Jesus. If we're going to keep the commandments of God and if we're going to have the faith of Jesus, we must be able to exercise patience. That's the characteristics of God. So before it mentions commandments, before it mentions faith of Jesus, it says patience. Are you patient? Don't answer. Are we patient? I might say I'm patient. You might say you're patient. But that doesn't prove that I'm patient. Because I think we would all like to be considered patient. But the only way you can be absolutely certain if you're patient is by what? What develops patience? Trials. Test. Temptations. Go to James chapter 1 with me. You see, Revelation 14, 12 is telling us that the people here, where it says, here's the patience, it's telling us that they've gone through an experience. In fact, yeah, go to James, go to James, go to James. Go to James chapter 1. What you're seeing in Revelation 14 where it says, here's the patience, they, they've gone through an experience of the three angels. It's, a, it's an intellectual understanding, but then it's something that one experiences as well. Look at James chapter 1 with me. We say, how is patience developed? We say it is through trials. James chapter 1 verse 1 says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Now, who is James writing to here? Who is he addressing his epistle to? Wait, wait, wait. Twelve tribes, Jews, 144,000. Wait, which one is it? House divided can't stand. Persecuted disciples, the church, the Jews. Wait a minute, let's, let's look at this. Verse 2. My brethren. Who are James' brethren? Those that believe in Christ. Who are those that believe in Christ? Who is he talking to? The church. Therefore, who are the 12 tribes? Israel. 
Who's Israel? <laughs> God's people. So who are the 12 tribes, though, in the last days? This epistle of James is written for who? 12 tribes, you and I. Notice, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Now, why am I to be happy and excited when I fall into temptation? Or is that your attitude when you fall into trials and temptations? Verse 3, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Why are we to count it all joy? Because it makes us perfect. In other words, because without temptation, your faith can't be tried. If your faith can't be tried, you can't develop patience. No patience, no perfection. So instead of murmuring and complaining and saying, why me, oh God, and why me? Yeah, why not you? I've called you. I've chosen you. What do you mean, why you? Let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So wait a minute. Revelation 14, 12. Here's the patience of the saints. Wait, if they have patience, that means that they've gone through something, right? They've gone through an experience. They've gone through what? They've, gone, they've, they've been tested. They've gone through a crisis. But the, it also lets us know that those people are what? Here's the patience. It says, let patience have her perfect word that you may be perfect. What kind of people are those in Revelation 14, 12? Here's the patience of the saints. What kind of people are they? Perfect. Truly? Can it be? Is it even so? No, that's something we, we have a difficulty with believing today. And Adventism. I don't know how, why it is that we talk about keeping the law and keeping the Sabbath, but, we, but yet we can't be perfect. What sense does that make? If we don't, be, if we don't believe in perfection in Christ, then we, why, why do we keep the Sabbath? Why do we keep the law? Somebody answer me that question. My Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise, the simple. If I don't believe that I could be perfect even as he is perfect, then I shouldn't be a Sabbath keeper. I shouldn't be a Seventh-day Adventist. These people here, here's the patience. Here, here are those that have been perfected by suffering and trials. Wait a minute. How was Jesus perfected? What did Jesus, how did Jesus learn obedience? Go to Hebrews 5 with me. Will the 144,000 go through the same experience that Christ went through? Amen. Is there guile in the mouth of the 144,000? No. Was there guile in the mouth of Christ? No. Will the 144,000 be judged? Was Christ judged? Who judged him? Pilate. Oh, who crucified him? Church and state, yes. Pilate judged him, right? What did Pilate say about him? How many times did he say that? <laughs> How many times did he say it? <laughs> you think so? Are you sure, or are you just kind of... Do you think? Or we're not, we're not too sure. Should we, should we investigate? Should we, should we see? I mean, what, 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 what happened? Well, let's read this in Hebrews 5 first, and then we'll go there. Hebrews 5. Notice what it says here. The Bible says in verse 6, as he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all that obey him. Same experience that Jesus went through. We're going to have to go through as well. This is what it means to follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. In fact, now let's look at John. Let's go to John. Let's see if we can see this in John. John 
18. John, the 18th chapter. Matter of fact, I, I, I believe John 19. John 19. John 19. Bible says here in verse number 4, it says, Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth wearing the crowns of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. And when the chief priests, therefore, and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto him, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. Now, I want you to notice that in this, this time period where they say we have a law, and by our law we ought to die. She applies this time to the she, she applies this language as to what the Protestants will be saying and the Catholics will be saying against faithful Advent is that we have a faithful seven day Advent is that we have a law and by our law they need to be able to die. Now here you have two times in John nineteen. I find no fault, I find no fault. But now back up to chapter eighteen and let's look at verse number thirty seven and thirty eight. 37 and 38 of John 18 says, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest I'm a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate said unto him, What is truth? And he, and, he, and he had said this, He went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find in him no what? And then in chapter 19 he says it two more times. So it's not an accident that Pilate, the governor, an earthly, worldly judge, examined him, investigated him, and found three times that there's no fault in him? Why is that? The three angels' message. It's all over the Bible. Now, it's so beautiful to me because we know that the lamb, is the lamb is without spot and without wrinkle. Isn't it beautiful that not only according to the sanctuary, we know Jesus had no spot, no blemish, but Jesus was even tried by an earthly pagan ruler and was found to be without fault and without spot before he died on the cross. That's beautiful. God wanted the whole world to know that his son was spotless, no blemish, no fault. Even the devil could testify that there was nothing in him. Jesus said, the prince of this world doesn't have nothing in me. That's exactly how we have to be. It's the same experience that the 144,000 go through. Now, as we prepare to come to a close, I want you to, let's go to this text in Romans 5 with me. Go to Romans 5. In Revelation 14, 12, when you see the patience being manifested, these people have been tested like Jesus was tested. These people have been perfected as Christ was perfected. I want you to notice what it says. And by the way, that word perfect, because we know Christ was perfect, that word perfect means he was completed, being completed. All right, being complete. He was a perfect man. The Bible says in Romans 5 verse 1, it says, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation. Why do we glory in tribulations? Also knowing that tribulation worketh what? Patience and patience what? Experience and experience what? Hope and hope maketh not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts uh, by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Here's the patience of the saints, or in other words, here's their experience. Here are they that have experienced the three angels' messages. That's what the Bible's telling us. Now in Revelation as we share these last thoughts with you, these last texts with you, Revelation 2, we're going to have to go through trials. We're going to have to be tested. It, through much tribulation, we must enter into the kingdom of heaven. 
So let us not murmur and complain against the chastening of the Lord. God has a purpose in doing this so that we can be partakers of his holiness, so that we can be perfect. Revelation chapter 2. Listen to what it says in verse 10. Revelation 2.10 says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried or tested. And you shall have tribulation ten days, but be thou faithful unto what? Yeah. Death, and I'll give thee the what? You see, the way that God knows that we're faithful is if we're tried and tested. It's one thing to be able to preach the message when we're free to do so. But what about when we're captured? What about when we're thrown in prison like John the Baptist? Wasn't John the Baptist a powerful preacher? He came in the spirit and power of Elijah. Baptized many people, said, saw Christ and said, Behold the Lamb. He, he saw the dove. He saw the Spirit of God. Behold the Lamb. He said it twice. But what happened when he got in prison? You read in Desire of Ages, imprisonment of John, imprisonment and death of John. What? What began to go on in John's mind when he was locked up? He started doubting, didn't he? For a while he did. He started doubting. He, he, he wondered. He, he said uh, to his disciples, go, go and ask him if, if he's the one. Or, or should we look for another? You know. Why do I bring that out? Because we're John the Baptist in the last days. I praise God John was able to get the victory, but... but what, how did John, what, what happened when the disciples brought the report back? Because what did Jesus say? When they came, they said, hey, John asked us, are you the one or should we look for another? What did Jesus say? Yes, tell John I'm the one. Or no, John, I'm not the one. What did he say to him? He said, go. He says, look, all the things you've seen, you've seen the gospel preached. You've seen the blind receive sight. You, you've seen the leopards cleanse, and you've seen the people healed and the dead raised. You've seen all this. Go and tell John those things you've, you've, you've seen. And then when they told him the report, then what did John do? He, he believed. He, he remembered. What did he remember? What was he reminded of? The prophecy. That's right. You see, what, see, what, what held his faith in that time? was the prophetic word. The prophetic word. Even Christ himself. It was, that was, that's what held him on the cross. It was, it was the prophetic word and what his father had said to him before is what held him when he was rejected of heaven and earth. Suspended in the middle. Earth don't want you and heaven don't want you. That's why he died of a broken heart. Literally. But John started doubting, but what helped John was when he recalled the prophetic word. And that's what's going to be a source of strength and help for us Amen. in these last days. Now, in Revelation chapter 3, Revelation 3.10, prison, tribulation, is going to bring out our faithfulness or lack of faithfulness. It says in John, uh, Revelation 3.10b, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them or to test them that dwell upon the earth. You've kept the word of my patience, I'm going to keep thee from the hour of temptation. It's going to try the whole world. Question, what's, what is this hour of temptation? That's going to come on all the world to try them. Very good. That's correct. The Sunday law. But we need to be able to show our work from the scriptures. You know, because at Seventh-day Adventists, we're, we're good at giving the right answers, but when it comes to going in to the scriptures of truth, sometimes we have a hard time doing that. So let, let's prove that. That's correct. Let's prove that. Go to Revelation 13. It'll be real simple. We have approximately about three more texts to share with you. Revelation 13. Listen to what it says. Verse 8, Revelation 13, 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. How much of the world? All the world are going to worship him. Who's the him? The beast. How do we know? Look at verse 3. Verse 3 of the same chapter. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world did what? 
wonder after the beast. When is all the world going to wonder after the beast? Sunday law crisis when his deadly wound is healed according to the Bible. Now, Revelation 17. What is this hour of temptation? The Sunday law time period. But now go to Revelation 17 because here we're going to end where we begun. In Revelation 17, 12, listen to what it says, talking about this one hour. And I don't believe it's a literal uh, one hour or symbolic time. I'm not saying what it is, but it is a period of, it is, it is a crisis that we have to go through. It's a period that we have to go through, a period of time, and I'm not saying when it begins, and, or I'm not saying there's a date for it, and I'm not saying when it ends. I personally don't believe that God has given us that burden to understand uh, how long or when it begins and when it ends. But in Revelation 17, 12, it says, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings. How long? One hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their, their power and strength unto the beast. This one hour is the hour of temptation. Have we ever, as, we, as we're about to close, have we ever seen an hour of temptation before in the Bible where God's people were tested? Where you can see the beast and you can see the kings of the earth coming together symbolically against the people of God. Is there ever been an hour of temptation in times past? Daniel's a good place. I want you to, I want you to go with me to Matthew 26. This hour of temptation has already been prefigured in the history of Christ. We want to share with you in Matthew and then share with you in Luke and then close. Matthew 26, listen to what the Bible tells us. Matthew 26, Matthew 26. And notice what it says here. And beginning with verse... 39, it says, And he went a little farther, and he fell on his face, and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep, and saith unto them, Peter, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The Spirit indeed is willing but the flesh is weak. How many times did Jesus pray for the cup to be removed from him? Three times. Three times. Now you know why. You understand why the three. Three angels' message. But notice, Peter, you couldn't watch with me for an hour? You, Peter, who said you were willing to, you're ready to die for me? You, Peter, who said you're ready to go to prison? Didn't he say that? You, Peter, who was so confident you thought you were so ready, you thought you were so, so, so willing. You can't even watch during this hour of temptation. And what happened in this hour of temptation? The Bible tells us in Luke 22, as I close, my last text, what happened in that hour of temptation? You see, the reason why Peter folded, not only did Peter have self-confidence, in the flesh, but Peter rejected the words of Jesus. Je uh, Peter rejected the prophetic word of Christ. Christ told him, listen, Satan is trying to sift you as wheat, but I prayed for you, and when you're converted, strengthen the brethren. He said, Peter, you say you're, you're willing to bear arms and you're, re you're ready to die and go to prison? I tell you that you're going you're gonna to deny me three times. What did Peter say? Okay, Lord, I don't want to deny you. I, I accept it. Lord, please help me. Please. I don't want to deny you. Please, Lord, help me. Is that? No. no. He said, even though all men will forsake you, I'm still going to die for you, Lord. Isn't that how we are? Oh, yeah, I'm ready for the new world order. Yeah, I got all my, my water stored up. I got all my cans, and I got all my ammunition, and I'm deep off in the mountain somewhere. I'm off the grid. No one knows where I'm at. I'm ready. 
Got my garden growing already. Got all my food crops. I'm ready. Bring it. Where's the spiritual preparation? I'm not, I'm not denying or belittling those that have all those things. God bless them. But where's the spiritual preparation? In Luke, notice what happened as I close here. Luke, Peter taking the, the sword and cutting off the ear of the high priest servant with the sword, thinking that the battle was going to be won by might and by power and by force, not understanding that the weapons of the warfare were spiritual, not physical. Physical weapons can't do any good against a spiritual fight. You need spiritual weapons to fight a spiritual fight. Instead of having that physical sword, you needed the sword of the Spirit, Peter. The sword, the Word of God, in order to hold you up in this crisis hour. But in verse 52, Jesus said unto the chief priests and captains of the temple and the elders which were come to him, Be come out against the thief with swords and staves when I was daily with you in the temple. You stretch forth no hands against me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. You see, the hour of temptation is the hour of darkness where the threefold union come together, the dragon, beast, and false prophet, to stretch forth their hands against us and persecute us, just like they did to Jesus, church and state. This is their hour, the power of darkness. Are we ready for that hour of temptation? Are we ready to stand in the hour of darkness? Are we watching unto prayer? Or are we like the disciples, sleeping in Gethsemane? Because the sleeping disciples, were told, represent a sleeping church. Or the crisis is coming with blinding speed and it is moving in darkness. Are we ready for that time period? We've been called. We've been chosen by the first and second angel's messages, but it is the third angel that will, de will determine who was faithful. But the assurance that we have, if we're with the Lamb, if we're following him whithersoever he goeth, it says that they're going to make war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome, because he's Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are also overcomers, because they've been called and chosen and faithful through the three angels' messages. And they've had a living experience in these messages. And therefore they are patient, therefore they are perfect. And they are ready for the crisis that is to come upon them. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the beautiful and glorious truths that you have shared with us. Your word has been mighty. It has prevailed to the utmost. It has given us that fire of the Holy Spirit. Our hearts have burned within us as we've been walking and talking with you through the word this week. And Father, we recognize that there are many challenges that are ahead of us and even things that we're dealing with now. Father, we're thankful that whatsoever was written aforetime was written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. We're thankful that all of these examples, in samples in the Bible, concerning the righteous of all the ages is pointing to the final generation. And we're so thankful that in such a time as this, you have seen fit to allow your glory and to allow your light to be bestowed upon 
your people here in Tennessee. We thank you that there are men and women and children that have responded to the call of being a student of prophecy and that they are also desirous to be prepared, not just physically, but also mentally and spiritually. And we're thankful that your word also gives us not only the, the knowledge and the instruction, but it also gives us the power of what we ought to be doing in these last days. So, Father, as we come to the end of this meeting and we hear the conclusion of the whole matter, we are to fear God and to keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. And so, Father, I pray that the work that has started here would continue for the days of our earthly probation that are left and that it would continue even on to eternity. And that as a result of being saved upon the sea of glass and singing the song of Moses and the Lamb, because of the victorious experience we've had over the beast, his mark, his image, his number, and his name, that we might be able to look back at this meeting as a turning point in our lives. Where it, is, it was these meetings that helped us to make our calling and election sure. To make sure that we settle into the truth both intellectually and spiritually. We pray that this day and that this experience would be written in the book of remembrance. For those that spake often one to another and thought upon your name and those that feared you. We thank you that you've hearkened and that you've heard our prayers. And so I pray for every family member here. I pray for the church body here where they're represented throughout Tennessee and throughout the world. And Father, I want to pray a special uh, prayer and of, of, of anointing and blessing upon your manservant, Elder Charles Wilson. I pray that you would continue to strengthen him and that you would uphold him with the right hand of your righteousness, that you would help him to be bold and courageous and strong in the Lord and that you would be with his wife as well, that she would help to hold up his hands in righteousness and in truth and in prayer and in whatever way that she can help aid and assist him in the work of being a watchman here in Tennessee. We ask that you bless the church members and the, the leadership and the people and that these meetings will continue and that it would grow and enlarge and, and expand and that you would also be with the new pastor that will be coming to the church that he will be one that will be able to bring spiritual guidance and spiritual leadership where the people will go higher and still higher and that he would be one that would accept and endorse the message of the hour. So thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. And save us into thy everlasting kingdom at the end. In Jesus' name, amen.